Six out of ten Republicans recommend FTR Radio to everyone they know. The other four are rhinos. FTR Radio. Online at FTRRadio.com. FTR Radio salutes some of the great Democrat presidents in the radio era. FTR Radio. You're listening to Liz and Taylor. All right, so why can't I get another tattoo? Come on. Because you get another tattoo, then you start talking another gun. But not the movie star. The battling duo from the right war on FTR Radio. Oh, come on. You're the one who said it. That was a joke. Partially. (laughs) Enlist in the right war. Won't cost you nothing. Not as good as military service. But it's got to count for something, right? Thank you for listening to FTR Radio. I'm Liz Harrison, and this is The Right War, and yet again, Taylor is missing. We have the hashtag floating around periodically. Where is Taylor? Uh, As I said last night, he is hiding from the Twitters still, sort of, kind of. Although I do occasionally get these subterranean messages. He disturbed me earlier today saying that a friend of ours was being attacked on the Twitter. And I'm looking at it and thinking, yeah, and he's a big boy and can take care of himself. But (laughs) (laughs) he is slumming on the Facebook and sharing cat cat pictures. That's because that's what girls do. Uh, Exactly. And Taylor is a girl's name. That's right. So, so, like, are we are we going to tell Taylor about all the, the, the BS I've talked about him while he's been off the air? No. Oh. He has no. to listen in. He has to listen in to hear that stuff. Exactly. Yeah. We're going to make him listen. Okay. So, of course, this is Jason Pye. Hi. We're not saying where he's from tonight because we're all in a really bad mood. <laughs> <laughs> Actually so. true. Actually true. Had a really long day today, so. Yeah, we'll, we'll do the obligatory uh, disclaimer. No, we are not speaking for anybody but ourselves, anybody who we actually publish with or work for or any other fun stuff like that. We have nothing to do with them right now. This is all our own opinions, and yeah, look out, because we're both relatively angry with probably about 10 people. Right. right. And this is, by the way, this is the second time this week I've had to give that disclaimer. Like I spoke on a panel for the Buckhead Young Republicans on uh, on Tuesday night, and uh, I, there were issues that were brought up. Obviously, because you're we talking to a young Republicans group, and uh, there were there were some issues that were brought up uh, that I expressed opinions on. I was I had to make very clear. I was like, these are just my opinions. I realized I was billed as being Jason from Freedom Works, but these are just my opinions. So right. <laughs> So I'd be really careful with that, and it's a fine line to toe sometimes. So, uh, right. but yeah, but no, we are angry at people. Yeah, mainly, mainly, ten people from different states who are did something very stupid today. Yes, they did. I, I was amused to see the absentee one. The abs. Oh, he did. He didn't vote. He didn't vote. Well, you know, he's been, this is actually kind of a, it's becoming a reoccurring theme, and it's a narrative that's picking up in the media. He's been missing a lot of votes lately. I'm not sure if he missed it, or it, well, he might have been on the road because the whole presidential thing, but I, I don't know if he missed it or just said, F you all. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, if he, if he did that, I don't see, I mean, <sighs> I mean, I don't know if he was in Washington, D.C. today or not. He may have had another fam- like a family commitment or something like that. Who knows? But for a guy who has staked his ground on opposing all- most of President Obama's nominees, I'm a little surprised he didn't show up. Um, well, I mean, I, I, can't I, ima- I can't imagine that he took a walk or anything like that during the vote just to avoid having to vote. But Well, you know. to be fair, I mean, there's still the option whenever you are doing a roll call vote on the floor. You can vote yay, yay, nay, or no present. vote. Oh, yeah. 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 And then no vote or present is the same thing in the count. 
Yeah. So I don't know if he was physically there. And arguably in this case, uh, he could have been there. I, I, I'll have to go and ask around and see if he was. And just basically was saying something even more than just voting no. Because if he realized, okay. Oh, no. An... He was there. Cause oh, he there's... was there? Yeah, he was there. Um, let's see. There's a press release on his Senate website. He says, uh, it says, well, it's in case you missed it, but it says he spoke today on the floor urging his colleagues to uphold the rule of law and oppose the nomination of Loretta Lynch to the Office of Attorney General. It says, it's, the title is like, Senate, Senator Cruz speaks on the Senate floor in opposition to nomination. Rule of law matters and we must uphold it. Okay, and, so this was definitely a statement then. This was a statement saying that... Um, not only am I not going to vote no, I'm going to say that uh, she doesn't even deserve me casting a vote in the first place. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm trying to find a speci- specific point. It was a five, ten minute speech, so there's only a couple lines, a few lines from here. Uh, Brian in the chat room says he was attending a fundraiser. Um, and the one thing I want to point out, I'm not, and let me just make it clear, I do like much of what Ted Cruz has to say on on right. many on many issues. So I'm not knocking him here, but there is a narrative that's developing in the media. Uh, Politico has covered this, and I know it's Politico, but they've gone through his votes, and he's missed a lot of votes the last couple of years. Uh, the last, well, since he got elected, and, uh, it, since he took office in 2013. So this is a narrative that's developing, and. There was a some speculation, and I thought it was projecting, but there was some speculation that his his vote or his his uh, his presidential run could be some sort of uh, referendum on the responsibilities of a senator. And a friend of mine who's who pointed that that line out to me, and I said, "Well, no, that'll be his his run for reelection in 2018. That'll be when the referendum on the responsibilities of a senator." But we also have to keep in mind that Kay Hagan in North Carolina was knocked extensively by. Tom Tillis and Republicans during uh, her run for re-election, which was unsuccessful, that she was missing a lot of votes and a lot of committee meetings. And in the and to be fair, Rand Paul was dinged recently for missing some uh, some uh, I can't remember which committee, but he was missing committee meetings as well. So these guys not showing up, and I think even Rubio has been cited for missing votes as well. These guys who are running for president and Senate in the Senate have to remember that they're going to get hit on this. Yeah, you know, and Cruz especially because he's the one who has uh, been the, probably one of the most outspoken, you know, about some of the nominations and about upholding the rule of law as we see in this press release. And he didn't vote. Now, you know, and no. if he was if he was off attending a fundraiser, why were you attending a fundraiser instead of voting against the attorney general? Uh, because the vote was illegal and she shouldn't have been up in the first place so therefore didn't deserve the vote in the first place well i mean just that, saying i mean that well, is a that is a viable reason well yeah but uh, what makes him di- what what makes her different from from uh chuck hagel what makes her different from the defense secretary nominee ash carter who who was confirmed a few months ago what makes her um, different what makes her different is something that uh, is going to be coming up on the floor in Congress at some point, probably within the next six months, because they're going to be nervous about her upping her game. And that is that they're going to do something about one of your favorite topics, civil right. asset forfeiture. I hope. So uh, there's, uh, if they don't, then they're just utterly and completely off their game. Yeah. So basically that would be the difference. Hegel and the rest are not engaging in a patently illegal practice as far as they're concerned. We have bipartisan support for reining in this particular power in government because the Democrats are smart enough to realize that this can go both sides. Well, let me let me let me interject there for one point because I, I, I agree with you on civil asset forfeiture being a completely illegal practice and contrary to the, the Fifth Amendment and due process and property rights. Um, I, this is an issue that I have been covering and writing about extensively for like the last three months straight. Uh, one thing I'll say though, it, it, when when it comes to you know a defense secretary or uh, like if you want to show if you want to take a stand on foreign policy because you know Cruz is one of these guys who's like he's he's a he brands himself as a constitutional conservative, and one of the things that 
with this president in particular has had has had a very uh, pernicious, you know, one of his one of his worst traits is that he goes to war without congressional approval. So, I mean, why not take a stand on the defense secretary and say we're not going to vote to confirm you until President Obama says, you know, go, he goes through Congress to seek congressional approval rather than take an expansive view of the War Powers Act, for example. I mean, um, that's why I'm saying I don't understand why he's she's different from a defense secretary nominee or you know we're not going to confirm the new nominee for HHS until until uh some of the more pernicious parts of Obamacare are repealed or, or you know you see what I'm saying I mean like there are well, other Well what is the defense use. secretary going to do? Well defense secretary doesn't set foreign policy and I understand exactly. that. Exactly. I I get that. I get that. But the defense secretary can I mean I don't know. It's just they I'm can't using stop it. the president. If they the can't president stop the president. Tells them, yeah, if the president well, tells and, them, and, it doesn't matter who it is. Well, and neither, neither can an attorney general. The attorney general is going to give an interpretation of the law, or their office is going to give an interpretation of the law that the, law that the president wants to hear. Exactly. So it's, but, you know, because all... We're I mean, talking about a specific action that has been performed by this woman in particular. Oh no, absolutely, and we can go into we we can cite a case right now. I mean, you have the the bi county distrib- uh, distribute distributors up in North Carolina. I think Reconcoma is where they're located, where she uh, the IRS showed up at their door or took seized their ba- three bank accounts of theirs, showed up at the door, explained what uh, that they were structuring their deposits. Basically, they were depositing, making frequent cash deposits under ten thousand dollars, which they did on the advice of their uh, their accountant. And the the IRS sees something like four or five hundred thousand dollars from them. Uh, they were presumed the money the money because it was believed to be involved in structuring structuring or some sort of criminal activity related to drug trafficking or money laundering was guilty until presumed uh, until proven innocent. Um, they they were involved in a more almost three year legal battle with the federal government to get the money back. And the seizing the prosecuting attorney Loretta Lynch. And very quietly in January, two months after she was nominated for this post, they gave the money back. A full settlement. Right. You know, so, I mean, and she has, and there are other, there are other examples as well, but I think in one year, I think fiscal year 2013, her office sees something insane like, I don't know, like $900 million or something like that. Just some insane, insane amount of uh, assets and, and cash from people. And some of them may have may well have been guilty, but because the standard one, the onus is on the property owner or the cash holder to prove the money or property's innocence, uh, the standard of proof is very low uh, for the government to proceed with a forfeiture. Um, most people just give up rather than fight. They figure the legal costs and the length of time it just isn't worth their time to fight it, so they just walk away. Um, and Loretta Lynch has been one of the more, uh, I guess, vigorous or, yeah, I guess vigorous users of, or, or participants in civil asset forfeiture. Now, see, I, I would like to just go and, you know, see her approach things as vigorously over at, oh, I don't know, MSNBC. Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, you well, know, what it, are they up to? They're up to close to $5 million that they owe the IRS collectively. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Of yeah, course, absolutely. 4.5 no. million is all on Al Sharpton. Right. I was going to say, of course, paying your taxes is paying your taxes and, and defending the Obama administration just gets you a time slot on uh, NBC. Uh, making bank account or making frequent deposits under $10,000 is enough to get your money taken from you and live in a, well, be put in a position where you have to live on credit and the goodwill of your vendors to get by. Right. You know, and that's. You know, I am. Look, I mean, I realize that, and it. The one thing I will say, to, I am. I am not the biggest fan of Eric Holder by any stretch of the imagination. I think most of what he does does is is horrible. But at least he did take a step, and I think we've discussed this before. He took a step in January to. Uh, in, in implement some administrative reforms to civil asset forfeiture, uh, basically saying that um, local and state governments can no longer uh, seize property under federal law and send it to 
the Justice Department for adoption or a federal agency for adoption through which they can receive what they call equitable sharing and get 80% of the proceeds back. Um, the problem is that policy, changing that policy only accounts for maybe it's something between 10 and 15% of all federal civil asset forfeitures. You, a, a, local, a state or local law enforcement agency can still, uh, in working in coordination with a federal agency, can still use civil asset, federal civil asset forfeiture laws and receive, in, uh, do the adoption and the equitable sharing. So there's still plenty of examples uh, or, or uh, leeway for abuse. Uh, and make no mistake about it, this is still happening despite these these reforms, very minor reforms. And like we like you mentioned earlier, it's one of those things that could happen pr- presumably in the next six months because really the leeway for go- uh, the window for governing is going to close bef- probably after August or September as the presidential campaigns really begin to heat up. Um, but you know when that it, there are. There's one bill already introduced, the FAIR Act, Rand Paul's bill, and then Chuck Grassley's working on his own bill, which, based on everything I've seen, appears to be very strong. And assuming it's not changed, would be a would be a very very positive reform. But um, yeah, I'm kind of I'm, ho- I'm not holding my breath, but I'm very 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 like much so crossing my fingers in hopes right. that we can actually get something done on this because, you know, for all the talk about. For all the talk about the Constitution, and I, I want to rip on a Republican here in just a second, but for all the talk about the Constitution and the need to rein in uh, the executive branch and all this stuff, civil asset forfeiture is one of the most, outside of like NSA spying and attempts to impose uh, free speech restrictions and sec- new gun control laws, civil asset forfeiture is one of the most egregious abuses abuses of, con- of the Constitution that exists right now. Exactly. But, with that said, since we're talking about uh, since we're talking about Loretta Lynch and another example of uh, you know executive overreach is you know she supports a very expansive view of executive power, and one of the most one of the biggest critics of of this brand of executive power has been Jeff Sessions, who's a senator from uh, Alabama, is Republican, and uh, during last week's hearing, a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing on civil asset forfeiture, Jeff Sessions was the only Republican senator who was defiant on any attempt to like rein in abuse of civil asset forfeiture. His and no kidding, there was a man testifying there from Tewksbury, Massachusetts, whose hotel was seized. The hotel had been paid off; it had been in his family for fifty years. Uh, it was worth in excess of a million dollars. His wife and him planned on uh, selling this thing. As, it was their nest egg. That's how they planned to live after retirement. They were going to sell it. And they were going to use the funds to live in retirement. Uh, but the local police seized it because they said it facilitated drug abuse. Keep in mind, this place has had like 15 arrests over the previous 20 years or something like that. Uh, oh, where good the, God. Right. So we're talking about a very, like, you know, but they just, you know, they suspected. And because of the low standard of proof, they were trying to have it forfeited. The Institute for Justice stepped in. He won. Uh, and they backed off. But Sessions, during the hearing, didn't outright say it, but very subtly suggested that even the property owner who appeared before that committee to testify on this abuse was somehow guilty of a crime. Really? He he didn't outright say it, but it was very strongly implied in what he said. Uh, I'm, mean, I'm sorry. I, I mean, we've been here. It, it, we had... Uh... I just don't tell that yeah. um, they ended up, I, I believe that they ended up going out of business in the end due to uh, overdue property tax. Mm-hmm. So that was arguably justifiable seizure. The pl- property was auctioned, but <clears throat> it had been across the street from another nuisance uh, property that was a strip bar. And between the two, there was a lot of drugs. A a strip club's a nuisance property? Uh, This one was because they moved... No, this one was because they moved quite a bit of heroin through there. Well, that is a nuisance property. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, there was heroin moving across the street. The motel in question was a no-tell motel. 
uh, let's put it this way. If you went there and stayed, uh, you got two complimentary cans of Keystone Light. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I think that covers it. You oh, know? my God. Well, yeah. I mean, it's just – it's one of those things where – and uh, Lunatic Rex says he probably probably vote for Jeff, uh, Jeff Sessions every six years. Long may he live. Uh, you know, for someone who whines, and, and justifiably so, even though I think Sessions overdoes the immigration issue to the point of absurdity – but he's right that the executive actions that t- have been taken by the Obama administration on immigration are unconstitutional. Uh, but on civil asset forfeiture, you know, he he's willing to defer and run run rough, roughshod over the Fifth Amendment, which explicitly says that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Civil asset forfeiture denies due process of law, completely oh, denies exactly. due process of law. Like I said, the the bedrock legal principle on which the United States uh, judicial system was founded is the presump- presumption of innocence. But in civil asset forfeiture cases, property is presumed guilty until proven innocent by the property owner. It's exact. It's a perversion of yeah. our justice system. Well, as far as hotels go, if you have a hotel, you've been in business for twenty years. You've had fifteen drug arrests in that time period. Right. You are ahead of the game, and you are doing better than uh, Hilton, Ramada. Uh, <laughs> I'll go on. I, I mean, I'm sorry. This is just the nature of the beast. I can't name a single hotel in this area. I can't name any single one that I've ever heard of that has anybody going to it ever that hasn't had at least one drug arrest per year average. Right. That's just the nature of the beast. Right. So what are they going what what are these assholes going to do sit there and say that Hilton, Ramada, Hampton, all of these people are are, you know, viable There's there's um, there's some sort of illegal that go act. And take their property? Right. But we do we do this in the name of the war on drugs. We we well, like I mean it, basically um and hold on a second. Lunatic Rex, uh, I just sent you a link to the video through chat. Um, that link, uh, it's it's a little further into the hearing, but uh, it's when Sessions is talking to the lawyer from the in- uh, Institute for Justice. And you should go check it out. I think it's a little bit later on in the hearing. But um, I know, I mean, there's there's not a hotel on this planet that that has not had some sort of illicit drug activity going on. Um. You know, let's let's just be real about that. There's there's at least one room every night that probably has some sort of drug activity going on. Whether somebody has pot in their possession, I mean, like it's, I mean, it's we're, the nature we're, of the beast. It's the nature of the beast. It, yeah, whenever you let strangers, it's a place where you can be relatively anonymous. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, it's just I, you know, it's just it's disappointing that. Sessions and lunatic Rex. I don't doubt that you you're anti civil asset forfeiture. I'm just simply saying that this did happen. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I love the one where they went and seized the whole uh, the whole assets of the gun shop owner. I'm sitting there thinking, oh, oh yeah. there's a new way to attack the Second Amendment. Oh no, absolutely. You know, and I tell you, and I and, I, and that's um, oh god, I can't think of the name. It's out here in Athens, Georgia. Um. Uh, it's at a uh, Clyde Armory. Andrew Clyde is the uh, is the uh, store owner's name. He's a, this guy's an Iraq War veteran. I think yeah. first Iraq War, but yeah. I mean, this guy's served his nation. He does everything. With, he served. I mean, for for God's sakes, I mean, the man sells arms to local police. Right. Uh, he's he's an upstanding guy, and it's the same case, same instance as the uh, the one that Loretta Lynch was involved in. It was an accused structuring case and. Frequent deposits under ten thousand dollars. The IRS seizes his nine hundred and forty or nine hundred fifty thousand dollars bank account, based on the mere suspicion. But you know, it, it, we do have the pro, uh, prospect of federal reform. There are many states that are reforming uh, their civil asset forfeiture laws. Just today, Montana, Pat, their legislature passed a bill that requires a criminal conviction. I mean, it completely does away with civil asset forfeiture. They require a criminal conviction before for, a forfeiture, forfeiture proceedings can begin. Again, and they raise the the standard of evidence from 
uh, I believe, probable cause to clear and convincing evidence, which is just below beyond a reasonable doubt, which is necessary for a, uh, a criminal conviction. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't have a problem with um, orders from the bench freezing assets for the purpose of preventing an individual from fleeing the jurisdiction. That makes sense. Yeah, but that's when sense. you're being held for trial. Right. But see, in, in civil asset, for, in structuring cases, freezing assets or, or confiscating bank accounts and t- seizing all the money in them, I mean, uh, the, the Institute that's for a Justice... Different, that's, that's a, a different, different thing. Well, well, the this in this particular instance... Um, let's see, like, okay, I just lost my train of thought because I looked down at the comments. No, I looked down (laughs) at the comments and saw something Brian wrote. Um, but no, I mean, we're, I mean, I don't, it's just, it seems, it seems very insane to me because in 33, I think the IJ found that 33% of these, it was, I can't remember the number of cases, but 33% of the cases, uh, Structuring was the only was the only cro- or so-called crime that police suspected. Yeah, and, or it was something. Well, some, it was something like that. I mean, we're talking in structuring. Anybody can do structuring. If you get if you get an inheritance and you keep the money out, you say you get five fifty thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars, and you decide, well, I want to deposit some of this. But you want to keep some out. Maybe you're thinking about buying a new car. Maybe it's something like that. It, it, even you know, and and you space those deposits over. That's enough to trigger, and you do it under ten thousand dollars. Frequent deposits under ten thousand dollars can trigger a structuring uh, report from a bank to the IRS, and the IRS can come in, sweep in, and seize your bank account. Maybe that's a, a weird example, but it's it is an example of how it can happen because at ten thousand, if you if you, because you're, the bank is supposed to, uh, under the Bank Secrecy Act, any re- deposit over ten thousand dollars, the bank is supposed to report it to the federal government. But they also report frequent deposits under ten thousand dollars. So right. you're basically, I mean, come on, it's it's ridiculous. And I can understand targeting, um, targeting people who are committing crimes such as money laundering or drug trafficking. Um, even though I think the war on drugs is gotten a farce farce. it's completely out of control and i'm not advocating for legalization here i'm just pointing out the fact that we're losing our civil liberties quicker than and it's at all sides of government not just the war on drugs but yeah i'm um, the one who advocates for legalization (laughs) but um anyway i was looking at the you know yays and nays and there's something that bothers me i I mean i ought yeah that's a no-brainer um Collins, same deal. Right. But, uh... Flake? Yeah, another one. Uh, uh, thank you, Arizona. Hey, I like Al- Although, you know what? McCain like must Flake want to smack Flake half the time. Probably. That's uh, a sad statement. Well, Flake just endorsed, or endorsed McCain for re-election not too long ago, so I'm sure McCain's probably thinking his lucky stars. But Flake, Flake one, the Flake one bothered me, because uh, I do like Flake. Um... Uh, Graham the, and Hatch were predictable. Graham and Hatch were predictable. McConnell, uh, McConnell deserves to be taken out into the woodshed and smacked. Kirk was predictable. Portman was predictable. Uh, because they're both up for re-election next year, so is Iot. Uh, McConnell actually did surprise now, me. Now, why, why in the world would this, of all votes, matter to somebody uh, looking for re-election? Because I'm sorry... Uh, we're talking about a woman who should, by all rights, scare the ever-living shit out of anybody. Sure. And their answer to their constituents to why they would not want her is quite simple. All they have to do is trot out these horrible examples of individuals who were not charged with any crime and scare the hell out of their constituents and say, this could be you. Yeah. There is nothing stopping them from walking in and taking your property, freezing your assets, emptying your bank account. Sure. Do you you think that I really would want to subject you, my constituents, to that kind of horrible behavior? Uh, I'm sorry. This is one where they could have gotten anybody on there. I don't even care what letter was after your name. No, I, no. Look, I I completely agree with you. Um, 
the I'm just simply pointing out the electoral aspect of this. I mean, in Johnson as well, Johnson. I mean, these Wisconsin, uh, Illinois, and Ohio are either blue states or purple states, and these guys in New Hampshire is as well. And these guys are scared to death of losing reelection. They know Democrats, if they vote against, they're going to hammer hammer them for. But even Democrats should be. Begging yeah, I, I was I, I was surprised Democrats at Mansion are... Mansion and Menendez. I'm surprised Menendez. they didn't cross party line. Oh, I mean, Democrats are the ones who, during the Bush administration, were screaming bloody murder about abuses or, or, or violations of the Fourth Amendment through 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 uh, warrantless wiretapping. Right, um, and but now it's all right when it, it involves money. Oh, for for the most part, yeah. Or when it, well, not just when it involves money, but it's okay when a Democrat does it. That's right. That's it. Doesn't one of the occur to them. Well, actually, it has occurred to them because these are the very same people who had when people did touchy feely, uh, try to see whether see whether or not they would go and try to do legislation before legislation that would rein this in. These are people who said they would. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I mean, I know Manchin would because because of the situation in West Virginia. West Virginia has a lot of Democrats that are actually Republicans, especially now given the war on coal. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, I mean, well, I mean it, well, it, it it's would worse than Pennsylvania the, with the uh, Republicans in denial. <laughs> right. No, absolutely. And one of the things with with Manchin, I mean. This is a guy who I still to this day has not – I don't – I have wondered why he hasn't crossed party lines because uh, I realize he is – he's, he's you know carved his niche as a conservative Democrat. But I mean I mean he's so, so much more conservative and than the, the modern Democratic Party. This guy is – uh, I'm not going to call oh, him. A yeah. Dixie. I don't want to. I don't want to demean him by calling him a Dixiecrat. But I mean, he is in the mold of a Southern conservative Democrat, and those most of those Southern conservative Democrats became Republicans in the '90s when the party exactly. started moving further and further to the left. Well, um, it's only because he's in West Virginia, and if you don't have a D after your name, at least up until the point where he was elected, now they're starting to elect ours. So I'm I'm wondering there myself. Well, I but, think he has enough goodwill in that state, despite despite the D next to his name, to pro- to possibly win re-election. I mean, I still think it's going to be a hurdle for him, but the Republicans have to find a decent candidate. The only reason, I mean, I don't say the only reason, but with Rockefeller out, they couldn't they couldn't field a decent candidate to beat, um, or whatever her name is. I can't think of her name off the top of my head. I didn't particularly like her as a candidate nor as a con- congresswoman, uh, Shelley Moore Cap- uh, Cap- Capito. Um, right. That was, that's her name. Um, but uh, Capito, um, I, I have no love for her except for the fact that she has an R after her name. Right. Well, I mean, as I'll, as I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I told the the people at the meeting on Tuesday night. Just because they have an R next to their name doesn't necessarily endear me to them or make me like them. So, because her well, ca- Capito, never mind. But but the alternative <laughs> in that particular election was really really reprehensible. Oh, sure. So it was definitely sure. No, no, no. I mean, we same in the Georgia Senate race. I mean, I had a I had a choice between uh, Michelle Nunn, David Perdue, and the Libertarian, who I actually knew and uh, but I, she was she had absolutely no shot in hell of winning and. Purdue, although I didn't, wasn't the biggest fan of him, I decided to go ahead and uh, vote for him. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, what what happened to McConnell? Uh, it's he is not behaving like a leader. No, he's not. He's beha- he's behaving like uh, like some. He's behaving. You know, he's majority leader. He's been majority leader for uh, almost four months now, and he's still acting like he's in the ma- minority. Yeah. You know, he struck a deal. They struck a deal for this this human trafficking bill, which would have been passed absent a dumb uh, not a dumb provision. Uh, it was uh, some language dealing with abortion, and I'm not knocking, I'm not getting in on the uh, uh, abortion debate. I'm simply saying that in putting that language in there for a bill like this, put the brakes on the bill. So he had to make a deal to get that passed, and the deal was: look, if you vote for this, I'll go ahead and confirm Loretta Lynch. Right. I mean, come on, man. You have... That's... That's... No. It, it was a joke. Because, number one, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, Democrats. Uh, I know how much you want to go and bitch and bone and say, oh, but it has some private funding. There's government funding. Right. And 
honestly, the mistake was in the writing of it. They made a mistake. They, they would not have had to bring up Hyde at all if everybody had conceded that victims of, well, victims of human trafficking, if they had been involved in a sex act, so therefore ended up pregnant, by default, it is rape. Right. That's all. Right. Well, guess what? That makes Hyde non-issue because right. there is already an exception for rape in right. Hyde. Right. So I, I don't even know where this argument came from. I don't know why it was there. It is absolutely childish bullshit. Yep. Because by definition, all of the girls that were involved here arguably could have had state funds used to pay for their abortions, theoretically, and not be in, in problems with Hyde. Because, I'm sorry, I am not going to let anyone sit there and tell me, especially in the letter of the law, that a victim of human trafficking would be capable of having consensual sex. There, there is no way to have well, consent. Well, I mean, we happen. have we have this thing called the age of majority because, by definition, oh, it's not even it's not even that. Oh, it doesn't oh, no, no, matter no, 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 what no, 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 their no, no, age no. was. I, I totally get it. No, I'm just saying. Like, I mean, we, I, I get it. I, I'm just saying. We, we, even if you were just talking about children or people who are under the age, I mean, even if I, I was just trying to make a different point, I, I apologize. Yeah, no, no, no matter what. It doesn't matter what age they were. They could be 42 years old. And The, guy, the guys in the chat room are still distracting me because they're talking about Grassley again. Oh, good God. Please stop. <laughs> Whatever. Either, 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 well, I'm not telling you guys to stop chatting. I'm just saying that every time I see a message pop up, it immediately t- takes my attention away because, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and Grassley is, well, no. Mm-hmm. Next well, I have, time. you know, there's there's some things about Grassley, the civil asset forfeiture issue, and we can complain about him all day long because uh, I have my complaints about him as well. Um, yeah, he's been good on that, and I yeah. kudos to him. The the one issue, there's one issue that I really am worried about him on, and that's mandatory minimums. But that's a topic for another day because Grassley is not very good on that issue, and he probably will hold up any significant sentencing reform, which is the mandatory minimums were nothing more than big government in the courtroom. So, but that's again, a topic for another day, uh, but civil, you know, but just wanted to say that about Grassley while you guys were knocking him around a little bit. Um, anyway, but you know, you're right, Liz, the Republicans made a, and this is what, and this is one thing that's becoming more and more apparent is Republicans make strategic mistake after str- – they're not thinking about the long game. No, they're not. No, I mean uh, – case, we- case in point is uh, thank you very much, Bobby Jindal, <sighs> because you have just rendered yourself completely and totally irrelevant. Don't bother announcing that you want to run for the presidency because I don't care, <laughs> and neither should anyone else. And why am I saying that? Because you – decided that it was a good idea to do an op-ed in the New York Times over gay marriage. Right. Yeah. Please stop. Please. Please. The world is freaking burning down. We don't have an economy that is worth anything. We are being held up by a an artificially supported market that the Fed is toying with to keep from going in down in flames. And you're sitting here worried about whether or not uh, Tom marries Jim. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Go away. No, it's in it, it's in Jindal probably is a more, a more, and this is actually maybe a topic you would be interested in discussing Liz. And I haven't, uh, it's, I just saw this today. Um, but Jindal's op-ed, it's, it, first of all, it, this is like three weeks after the whole Indiana kerfuffle really boiled over. Right. I mean, talking about being in a safe zone when nobody's paying attention. Right. And then two, um, there's actually another, there's a Congre- uh, Congressman Steve King. Have you seen, he's proposing legislation to limit courts from, uh, federal courts from any, any uh, considering any marriage cases. Yeah. It's, it, yeah. 
So, did you read his press release? Um, yeah, I did, and I, I, I have to admit, English, it, it was, it was challenged. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was sitting there, and I'm like, okay. I sort of kind of understood the beginning of it, and then I got to the end, and I'm like, huh? And, and this is bad, considering that I'm capable of, you know, doing the English-challenged... Oh, no, not... ...legislative English. writing. And I'm like, what? <laughs> well, you're, no, you're absolutely right. It, it's that, plus, there was a particular passage in this bill, and this is, uh, this is another guy who he... He says, and this is, I want to read this, I want you not to pay attention to the issues. I want to pay, want you to pay attention particularly to the first and last sentences. But I'm going to read the sentence from the, from the, uh, from the, uh, the press release. For too long, federal courts have overstepped their constitutionally limited, limited duty to interpret the Constitution, said King. Rather, federal courts have perverted the Constitution to make law and create constitutional rights to things such as privacy, birth control, and abortion. These unenumerated so-called constitutionally protected rights were not envisioned by our, envisioned by our founding fathers. Now, let's, the reason I have a problem with this is not the issues he cited. Because... I actually do actually, and I will say this: one of those issues I do think he's wrong, and that is, I think there is a constitutionally protected right to privacy. Yes, but birth control and abortion—you're f- fair enough, fair enough. Right. But these unenumerated so-called constitutionally protected rights are not envisioned by our founding fathers. What he has—he—he's—he's he's trying to fit an argument. His premise is wrong. There are unenumerated rights. The, we have this. We have the Ninth Amendment, which says the rights can, you know, the rights listed are not meant to disparage or deny rights uh, retained by the people. The founding fathers understood there were so many rights we literally could not list them. They could not, literally not list them all. Right. And but their view of rights was what we call uh, natural rights or negative liberties. The rights that the birth, the right to birth control and arguably the right to an abortion are. Positive liberties, which mean they inf- you have to take from someone or infringe on someone's rights to have those rights. Birth control, you're saying you have a right that means your employer has to pay for it, for example. Or the right to an abortion, and people who are pro-life would say, well, you're, inf- you're taking someone's life to have that right. Um, right. So, you know, those are positive liberties. Privacy is a negative right. It doesn't hurt anyone. It doesn't cost anybody anything. It's not an infringement on any, anyone's rights. Now, criminals who who commit crimes have no re- reasonable expectation of privacy. That's you know, that's but they still police still have a procedure in the Fourth Amendment to you know through warrants and probable cause. But there's no imp- there's no imp- uh, definitive right to self defense in the Second Amendment, right, Liz? I mean, we but the interpretation is. I, as, a, as an individual, have a right to self, self-defense self through the Second Amendment because I have a right to keep and bear arms, correct? Correct. Uh, so I have a right through the Fourth Amendment to uh, fr- uh, to protect to protect myself or the government per- forbids illegal searches and seizures. So I have a guaranteed and implied right to privacy. Right. Um, so that's, it's, that's one of those things that's like, you know, it, you're making an argument that honestly, I see what you're trying to say, but you say it in a way that really kind of um, clouds the issue, and you're arguing against same-sex marriage. Because what you're trying to do is close off federal courts from arguing on same-sex marriage, which again is a right that doesn't really cost anybody anything. It doesn't infringe on anybody's liberty to make an argument that all these trains of rights that aren't, don't really exist. Courts have said they do exist. Make your argument better. And he's doing it to appeal to people who, to conservative Christians. And I understand that, but well, I just have a problem with the way it was worded. And you talk yeah. about Jindal, you talk about Jindal and what he said, and you're absolutely right. Jindal's more important because he's running for president, but I thought Steve, Steve King's press release was, was actually a lot worse. Yeah. Steve and King. Just, well, Steve King is Steve King. He screws it up. 
But the bottom line is that he was on the right track whenever he was saying that this is something that should be managed by the states and the federal government should be specifically forbidden from playing around. Well, I don't in sure. This. Well, I mean, this sure. is a state issue. Well, I don't and think it's arguably I don't actually... it's because of the the overreach of the First Amendment that has caused the problem. And I hate saying that. I, but I just, this is a purely legal argument here, folks. I am not suggesting that we should be infringing on the right to free speech by any stretch of the you're imagination. Talking about the, you're talking about the Establishment Clause. I am talking about jurisdiction. Ah, okay. My, my, Congress I, shall make no law. Okay. The implication there is that they are forbidding the federal government from making any law that would infringe on those particular rights. The further implication is that the states could arguably go their own way whenever it comes to certain things that are protected on the federal level. In other words, the Fed is not allowed to get into the fray here. However... They were recognizing the fact that because we had a vast number of people that came to this country specifically for the purpose of avoiding persecution due to religious beliefs, and they all decided to live in the same areas, that arguably they might want to form some state laws that would follow with their religious principles, and they were not going to tell the states they couldn't do that. Make sense? Makes sense, but we have the Fourteenth Amendment, which has given us the doctrine of incorporation, and those that the First Amendment has been incorporated to the states. I mean, that's game over. Theoretic, yeah, no, theor- not, not not theoretically, literally. I mean, it has been incorporated to the states, and I don't have a problem with that. I mean, that's that's why we had the Second Amendment incorporated to the states, thanks to McDonald v. Uh, Chicago. Without the doctrine of incorporation. And I would argue that the Privileges and Immunities Clause are, extends those rights anyway to the states. But the court has taken a, a selective due process, and they're doing they're incorporating rights as they come along through through whatever arguments before them, whether it's the First Amendment or the Second Amendment, or so have you. Um, yeah, but the problem that we're facing here is that between equal protection, the First Amendment, and incorporating the First Amendment into the state laws, we're getting into weeds where rights are trumping rights. Well, one other thing I want to say, actually I want to say two things, um, and I'm trying to find it right now, um, and it's just going to take me a second, so I'll go to my first point, uh, my first point, Um, and I'll tell you, I'll say what I said Tuesday night when this issue came up in this, in this meeting with the young Republicans in Atlanta, uh, or Buckhead, um, at the end of the day, you, you say it should be – the federal government shouldn't be shouldn't be involved. I would argue – and it should be up to state governments. I would argue that no government should be involved. Right. Um, and and that, I think that's – and if Republicans have spent the early 2000s through, the, through 2004 focusing on that, this it would be an entirely different conversation. We would not be having this conversation today. Well, I'd I mean, argue that we're never going to be able to divorce marriage from the state completely because of our tax code, and we're not going well, to see that and, change any time And that's soon. another problem. And that's another problem because and – and there was someone who asked this question to me the other day. He's like, well, uh, you know, he's, he asked me if I – why – some question like why something about same-sex marriage and, you know, would we call it – if we didn't call it marriage, do we have to call it marriage? I was like, well, marriage is no longer a religious institution. It's something that's embedded in our tax code. Um, well, no, I mean, it, it's still both. Oh uh, no, no, it's no. Well, it, you you are right to some degree. I mean, but no, it is, it's still both. No, it's 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 really not. No, yes, it is because think about it. Okay, when you go to the state, you get a marriage license. It isn't legal until you go and have it signed by an officiant, and that person can either be an operative of the state, namely a justice of the peace or a sitting judge, what have you, or a it can be a, a member of the of the clergy. Sure. So. Now, the members of the clergy are not government employees. They are not government operatives. They are simply given the power by the government to make a document legal. 
much the same way a notary would be, but that 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 is something that is a legal thing there. Now I've said that maybe the solution lies in doing something close to what Pennsylvania already does where you can have a marriage that doesn't require an efficient and you just need the signatures of witnesses. But, uh, which by the way is a religious law. But <laughs> anyway, I think, um, I think yeah, I think that they should make it that you don't have to go to the county to get your marriage license. You could get it directly from the church or you get it from the county or you get it from oh, whomever is going to officiate your, your, your marriage. Sure. But then... It become make sure that you make the language clear and basically say nobody outside of a state employee, a state government, um, is required to give you said form and sign it and make you legally married. But no matter what, you always have the government or a non or a secular entity that has been given power by the government to do it for you. You you see where I'm going there? Then you know, I think we'd have an end to these arguments because then you could just sit there and say to people who are gay, "You want same sex marriage in this particular church? Fine, go take it up with the leaders of that church and talk them into going and accepting your union." No, but you're they are not legally Liz, Liz, required Liz, 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 to Liz, accept you. You're absolutely right, and I'm not arguing to the otherwise. I think okay. churches. I think, I've, and I've always said that in every discussion we've had about this subject. I've always said no church should be forced to recognize a uh, uh, recognize a marriage. But you a, know that that's where they're heading. Oh no, and I'll be one of the first people to say that they, that people that gay couples who try to do that are wrong. And I mean, you know, if I was a lawyer, I'd file a brief with whatever court I had to file with. Hell, I'll sign one if I'm asked. Hell, I uh, want to see laws that sit there and say that the free market decides and people can decide as a business for whatever reason. I, I mean, hell, they could look at you and say, I don't like your nose ring, so I'm not going to serve you. But that's well, neither here nor there. People, people with nose, nose rings aren't a prote- protected class of people. Uh, but No, but I, what I'm saying is no, I know what you, you, I know you exactly have what the right to sit there and say, okay, this is my business. I am a private citizen. I know. I don't have to serve you. I know. I know what you're saying. But the one thing with with going back to the marriage issue before I go on to my other point real fast, uh, because I know we're running out of time, was that you know you have the first of all, marriage is a contract in my opinion. It is a contract, and any couple who wants to go in and have a co- to sign a contract say they're married should be able to have that done. Um, and th- that's it's we treat it just like we would any other binding legal document. You want to have that document taken apart? Go to court to get it taken apart. It still involves some government, but it's not as government. There are no like real tricks to it, with the exception of just treating it like a regular contract. The other thing is the the tax code implications are very real, and there's not just the tax code code implications. You also have visitation rights. You also have like you have the the insurance. case that insurance insurance you have that. The, you have you have the case that dealt with the uh, with that brought down Doma, which forbade a woman from inheriting. Uh, what was rightfully her? She was the executor of the estate. She was the sole uh, recipient of the inheritance, but she had to pay a, ta- a higher tax rate than what was required because she because the marriage was not legally recognized by the federal government. Right. That's that's wrong, in my opinion. That's wrong, and that's what we I come agree in, with you there. And that's it. So we, we we definitely agree on that. That's where the equal protection. Law of course, I'm, I'm also for the concept of you know putting an end to inheritance tax, but that's a whole. Oh, other well, that's issue. that's I 100 percent agree with you. Uh, and another we, but it's just it's one of those things where the equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment comes into play, and that's where a lot that's where the trick is because you have this establishment established case law already through the Loving case in, in 67 that said marriage is a right and it's protected by the equal protection clause of the of the 14th amendment and again marriage does not necess, does not infringe on anybody's liberty it doesn't it's an, it's a and like i said i've argued before and i'll continue to argue this okay it's, now it, what was your other point because we, we are, are in time. Uh, you were talking about constitu- like the state should be able to determine their own laws and um Really, it is just a formality, but I just wanted to point this out that Pennsylvania does have a, a freedom of the pre- uh, press and freedom of the speech clause in its constitution. And as most states do, most states have 
uh, either copied the United States Bill of Rights or implemented their own language to reflect the principles of the Bill of Rights. Uh, right. So in some respects, we are arguing a non-point here because um, a lot of states have already done that. But I know we're running out of time. We have like two, three minutes left. So Yeah, but basically, like I said many times, I, I mean, I, I always laugh because they sit there and say about separating... Uh, religion and government and I I laugh because I'm sitting here in Pennsylvania we have laws on the books that are straight from the Quaker faith so the most notable one is marriage but there are a few others that are more obscure go figure anyway we're we're at about that time so of course you can find Jason at Jace Liberty on the Twitters and now we could say, yeah, you're from Freedom Works. <laughs> yeah, I work at Freedom Works, and, and with everything, everything but the exception of civil asset forfeiture, uh, are my own views, and those are also my own views. Civil asset forfeiture, but Freedom Works happens to dive into those as well. Right. So thank you very much, folks, for listening. Maybe we'll eventually find Taylor. Who knows? We'll find <laughs> out. Have a great night, folks. I believe I have Colin Flaherty next week on Wednesday. Good night. <laughs>